You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I am Paul Garner. And I am Todd Wood. And uh, we've got a great episode lined up for you. This is uh, another, the second in our series of episodes about uh, a very important question within flood geology, which is uh, where does the flood end in the geological record? Now, that might sound like a a kind of esoteric (laughs) question for those of you who are not immersed in uh, all of these issues, but actually it's a really important question because. Uh, not only is it important for ha- how we develop our flood models, it's important in terms of answering lots of other questions too, uh, questions about the scale and the intensity of catastrophism after the flood, uh, the diversification of the animals as they came off the ark. Uh, there are chronological questions about how we understand the Genesis genealogies and the dating of things like the Tower of Babel. All kinds of questions are kind of tied up for creationists in this issue of where is the flood located in the geological record? And uh, those of you uh, who joined us for our last episode will remember that Todd and I uh, were talking about this question, just trying to set the scene. We were, we were giving some historical uh, context to how creationists have thought about this question beginning with the scriptural geologists way, way back in sort of the early part of the 19th century and coming through to the, the present day. And we talked to, we introduced some of the uh, different opinions that creationists uh, hold today. There are two main positions. Uh, there is the position that the flood boundary is uh, quite late in the geological record, so essentially just below the Ice Age deposits, so most of the fossil-bearing portion of the geological column is flood deposited. And then there are other creationists who want to sort of put the, uh, the, the flood boundary a bit lower in the record, maybe around the time where the dinosaurs disappear from the record. And those are the two main positions. There are also some other positions where people put the flood boundary in, in other places, but uh, those are only held, I think, by a relatively small number of creationists. So we're going to focus on the two uh, main positions. and. Uh, We've deliberately in this series, Todd, um, wanted to sort of focus on the positive arguments for each position. We didn't just want this to be a debate. Uh, you know, we we are aware that people hold very strong opinions. They have strong views about these things. And we really just wanted to give some of the best um, proponents of each position the opportunity to set out their case so that you know, our listeners and viewers can can hear it for themselves. So, uh, so that's kind of why we structured it this way. Um, and uh, listeners and viewers to this podcast know that we we like to be sort of careful and deliberate in how we handle these topics, particularly if they're topics where where there's some disagreement. And uh, so that was that was what we decided to do. And we are very pleased today to have with us Dr. Tim Clary from the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, Welcome, Tim. Thanks for joining us today. Well, no, it's it's a pleasure. I'm glad you guys uh, invited me to to participate in this symposium. This this is really, really, really neat, really going to be fun, I think. Yeah, I I hope so. And we're really glad that you could could join us. Um, Tim, why don't you uh, begin um, by introducing yourself to our viewers and listeners, tell us a bit about your background um, and also your role there at ICR. Okay, uh, I came out of a oil and gas background. I started working when I came up with my master's in geology. I, I worked for Chevron Oil Company, bounced around the United States, different places, and ended up working in the Gulf of Mexico for a few years and doing sequence stratigraphy, which is something I do research on now. Uh, but uh, and then I got laid off because as geologists, if you're too good at your job, find too much oil, oil prices crash, and so they laid off 60 percent of their exploration staff that year. Oh, and I no. used that opportunity to go back and get a PhD. I never would have got a PhD other than that. So that kind of forced my hand. I so I ended up paying for part of my PhD program, and I got assistantships and things. So I got a I ended up getting a PhD at Western Michigan University in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. 
And there really is a Kalamazoo, as they say. And uh, it was it was a fairly new program, but I only had a month to get in. So I got in, but I, I worked in area out in Colorado and did a lot of traditional geological field work and research and things. But I always, you know, kept track of Steve Austin and others at ICR and John Morris when they were coming to the area. Uh, I ended up getting a teaching job in Michigan at a public college for about 17 years. And so I knew those guys. I worked on the FAST project a little bit, uh, which was a program funded by ICR that Steve Austin and Kurt Weiss and John Whitmore and others uh, worked on some geology trying to you know, show the rapid sedimentation, rapid tectonics. And I was working on the tectonics side of that. But uh, so I knew the guys. And then eventually there was, there was an opening and, and John Morris, who recently just passed away, he was instrumental in kind of bringing me to ICR and saying, you know, you should come in here. We need a new geologist. I'm not, you know, I'm going to retire in a few more years. And, and sure enough, he did. And uh, But we overlapped enough that he kind of got me started on that on the project that I do. And so what I've been doing for the last 10 years since I joined ICR is mapping out the sequences, what we call the mega sequences, which are the major, you know, transgressions and regressions. For the non-geologists, that's where the sea floods the land and backs off a little bit. It floods the land and backs off. And even the conventional geologists believe there were six floods. And so they named these these kind of strange North American native tribes names like Sauk, Tippecanoe, Kaskaskia, Absarica, et cetera. And so if I throw those names out there a little bit, that's where they came from. But we found out that these actually uh, can be correlated around the world. So I've looked at five continents now. I've got five continents completed. And I'm uh, working on the sixth continent, working on Australia, which is the sixth continent. And then eventually I'll try to do a little, what I can around Antarctica. But uh, So I've been doing basically geological research, mapping out the rocks that are still there today as much as possible, using oil well data and some of the background that I think God prepared me for this by allowing me to work in that field in oil and gas to use oil and gas well data and, and you know, know what's important, what's not. And uh, most of what my data is about, I would say at least 80 to 85 percent repeatable. There are places where I have to guesstimate, you know, what's because they don't always drill to the crust. And so sometimes you have to kind of guess what's down there from what people think. And But it's been a fascinating study for 10 years. And I've, some of what I'm going to talk about today is the result of that study that I've been going continent by continent. So five continents down, sixth one, I'm working on it. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that turns out in the next year or two, God willing. That sounds like a humongous amount of work. You're compiling this data from like publications and things? Yeah, mostly. I mean, they, they, a lot of the oil companies like to brag about their discoveries. And so they'll publish, uh, you know, a couple years after they discover something, they'll publish the column, the rock column and things like that. So it is really the, the real rocks in place. And and I've got, I don't know, 3,500 3, columns globally. It doesn't sound like a lot, but you put it on a map, you know, it covers every major basin, every major uplift everything pretty much as you go around the world and and uh, even though europe's not very big it took me a long long time because it's three years in itself to compile the data there but there's, there's data everywhere some places i'm not sure if china's given me the true story because sometimes you'll see things that lined up like this in the same area and i'm like one of these is wrong and so i had to kind of draw in what i was learning from you know yeah everywhere so i know enough geology about everywhere in the world to be dangerous is what it comes down to <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I've learned enough by putting the columns together. That it's, it's, it's been a fascinating study, and you know, I have to thank ICR and John Morris, or, you know, and Henry Morris, who brought me in here. And now our current boss, Randy Guzer, for letting me continue this project. It, it's been a real joy. But in the process, I'm finding that you know where where I believe the flood boundary was may not be right. I think that's why I'm one of the advocates for moving it up because of the geology. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Well, I, th this is great. So, you know, I, I, our viewers and listeners can see that Tim, you know, has a huge amount of uh, experience, a kind of wealth of experience in uh, oil exploration and in compiling geological data and in studying rocks in the field. And in fact, in our in our first episode, when we were sort of introducing this topic, we were talking about some of the earlier uh, generations of creationists. Some of those guys didn't have that kind of field experience. You know, people like George McCready Price, they, they didn't really go out and look at the rocks. Um, but, you know, Tim has done that. Tim, Tim, Tim is very familiar with the rock record. So, uh, you know, who better to kind of present uh, the, the case that you're going to present, Tim? So that, that's really great. Um, well, I think, you know, maybe from here we should begin to sort of um, talk about uh, this position. So, 
could you just sort of explain the position? You've sort of touched on it there briefly, but the position that you hold concerning the flood post flood boundary, you, you may have to sort of unpack a little bit, just remind our uh, viewers and listeners about the geological column and so that it kind of makes sense to them. Well, when I, when I was, before I kind of joined ICR, you know, I had read a lot of the research and publications by you know, Andrew Snell and Kurt Weiss and, and uh, you know, many of the other big names in the creation community. And uh, it's so I, you know, I kind of agreed with them on the KPG boundary, the end of the Cretaceous KT, it used to be called, as kind of, you know, potentially end of the flood, because that seemed to be what they were seeing. And I said, well, they must, they've been looking at this longer than me, uh, and from the creation standpoint. And then after I started plotting up data, even across North America, about two years into my study, I'm starting to think, hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rocks above that KPG, and that as I studied rocks and I went to other continents, I started seeing the same patterns, which to me verifies there was a global flood. You see almost the same, what I call a progressive flood. Uh, the waters, you, know, you start more and more coverage. And oddly enough, North America is probably not the place to start because it's, it's different than a lot of the other continents because a lot of it floods early. And I think that has to do with its pre-flood, what it make up what North America was compared to the other continents. But most of the other continents don't really flood much early on in what we call the rock record in the from the Cambrian up through uh, maybe the, the middle of the Phanerozoic. There's really not a lot of flooding in most of the continents compared to what we see in North America. So I started looking at the rocks and realizing there's a lot of data, there's a lot of rocks above the KPG, that, a lot of fossils, et cetera, first appearances of many things. And so to me, I started thinking, well, maybe the data is saying that it should be higher. Maybe we should move it higher. And that's kind of why I've Try, I really believe it or not, I tried to let the data lead me into this. And, and as a geologist, I'm biased towards rock data and geology data. And, you know, the paleontology is very, very important because it's what's in the rocks and it gives us clues too. I don't want to discount that. But, uh, you know, my biggest uh, kind of arguments with people, I guess, deals with the paleontology versus the geology. And and so we'll, we'll get into some of that when I, I just really appreciate you guys letting me a chance to explain some of the geology that does, in my opinion, moves the boundary up higher, and, it may, and I kind of tentatively put it at what I call the NQ, which is the neogene, the top of what used to be the tertiary, and then the Q is the quaternary, which is really in the ice age, the Pleistocene comes in. But right. you know, sometimes I'm not sure if they've dated those rocks right. You know, is it truly right. Pliocene or is it Pleistocene? And there's a little discrepancy at some of the, at the top a little bit. And, and so it's very difficult. As you, as you mentioned earlier, it's very important to kind of have a flood boundary you want to know where the flood rocks are if you're going to study the flood. And so, and I, the book that I've written called Carved in Stone, sorry for the plug, but it talks about three continents. And, and in that book, and, and even my paper, it's going to be coming out, hopefully, if it gets accepted by ICC, I talk about, I'm not sure where the flood begins every place. Because there's some places where there's a lot of Precambrian sediment, and I'm not really sure if that is all part of the earliest flood, or if that's you know, between the creation and the flood, those 1,600 years or so. And so there's still a question about that. But I, but I think I have possibly a better handle on the end, at least close to the end. It's, I kind of put it as a high Cenozoic uh, flood. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll list some of the reasons why or kind of as we go through them today. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the rock data to me that is, what lead, is what's leading this push that I see, as you'll see. So, so ignorant question here from a non-geologist. It sounds like you've come back around, if I can put it that way, to sort of Henry Morris's view of the flood, where uh, maybe not a randomized order of the rock record, but at least most of the fossil record is produced by the flood directly. Is that is that right? Most of it is right. That would be the yeah. I, did, I mean, I didn't haven't read Henry Morris's books until you know I started looking back, and so you know just to see what he thought because I had to go back when I started publishing on this. You know, what did other people think? And and yeah, that's what he that's what he said. He basically, he, he included most of the what's called it used to be called the tertiary, uh, which we now call the Paleogene Neogene. But so if I use that term tertiary, it's almost easier because that's the Tejas mega sequence, and so. If I say Tejas mega sequence, it's the same as the tertiary, which is the the Cenozoic, except for the Ice Age and, and today's you know part of the Cenozoic as well. But that's that's true, Henry. That's what uh, apparently Henry Morris said that, but yeah, he wasn't the reason I came back to it. The, you know, the reason I came back was, was from the geology that I see globally. Yeah. But it, it is nice that you know I'm working for ICR and and our founder, 
you know, did kind of <laughs> say the same thing. So yeah, he he was right yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, that's always a good thing to say about the founder. <laughs> And and you're right, you're right, Tim. Uh, there's also a whole load of different, uh, you know, positions about where does the flood begin, and uh, yeah, maybe that's a topic for another <laughs> another yeah. series of episodes maybe next in the year. podcast. <laughs> maybe next year, but um, but yeah. So let let's kind of focus then on on that flood post flood boundary. So so you you're you've become convinced that it's it's high in the. Uh, Cenozoic, the, the tertiary, if you like, we we referred to the tertiary in our last episode because we we talked about how the uh, geological record used to be divided up into primary, secondary, tertiary. You know, back, back as the geological column was being developed, and that term tertiary is kind of you know that's that's persisted. Um, uh, and so you put it very high um, in in the tertiary. Probably just below the the ice age deposits or thereabouts. So, Correct. yeah, yeah. And as as you know, as we saw last time, um, this is a position that has deep historical roots because uh, you know, as we've already said, it was a position that was held by uh, Henry Morris um, in the Genesis Flood in 1961. But it was also held by people before him. It was held by Macready Price. Harold Clark probably held a position that was that was very similar to that, um, and, and so, yeah. So it's so it's a it's a position that has a long sort of intellectual tradition with, within creationism. And I, Todd, as we were talking about this episode, you know, we were also saying there's a kind of a certain obviousness, an, an yes. intuitiveness. To, yes. to this position. So just explain what you meant by that when you, when you said that. Yeah, I, ju I just feel like, you know, when, you, when we look around in the world today, we don't see a lot of fossils being formed new, right? And you look at some of the fossils in the fossil record, um, and, and, and I can think of, you know, all these great deposits of mammals from the Cenozoic that are just pristine skeletons in perfect articulation, and you think, Whatever did this it has to be something different than what I'm seeing around me today. And so it just feels like this intuitive thing that, oh, if that's a fossil, that's got to be from something really unusual. And the obvious choice of really unusual geological event is the flood. So it just seems to me that there's just this intuitive, oh, yeah, that makes, of course, that makes sense. If this is a big, a big deposit of mammal fossils, it's probably deposited by the flood. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of brings us then, uh, Tim, to the, the next sort of section of this episode where we really just wanted to give you the opportunity to tell our viewers and listeners about some of the evidence that's particularly persuaded you that that is where the flood post flood boundary should be located, high in the Cenozoic. And we've really, you know, we, we haven't scoped out, yeah, you know, we normally prepare an outline for these episodes where we, you know, we, we we talk about what we're going to say, but we have left this a blank because we want you to kind of fill in the blank. So this is this this is I your thing. Oh, good! I've got a script. <laughs> I scripted it for you. We don't want to kind of direct you. We just want you to have the freedom to present what you want to present. So, so what are some of the arguments that persuaded you, Tim? Okay, well, one of them goes back to uh, John Baumgartner, and uh, he and I are agreeing. Quite a bit, uh, you know, the mechanism of the flood has to do with this runaway subduction process, or this what's called catastrophic plate tectonics, and the idea that the plates moved really, really quickly during the flood year, and that you know was continuing uh, through across the KEPG boundary. You still see major amounts of ocean crust still forming. So if that's truly the mechanism mechanism of the flood, which I believe it was, because it was pushing up seafloor from below by making new seafloor, which made the waves go higher and higher and higher. Uh, and I see that progress, progressive, you know, nature of the flood as I, as I do my research, kind of by kind of. It seems to make a lot of sense that the flood wasn't over if the mechanism was still humming along, and we see at least a third of the ocean crust, uh, in some places almost half the ocean formed in wow. the Tejas or the Tertiary, you know, whatever you want to call it. And even India hadn't even collided with with uh, Asia yet, according to the plate tectonic models. Uh, that didn't happen until into the middle part of the Tertiary, really. And so these major collisions and mountains that were forming all over the world, about 80% of the world's mountains all pop up uh, during the tertiary earliest part, uh, particularly, 
the Andes, the Rockies, uh, even a lot of the Alps, the, you know, the Himalayas, obviously, because the collision. All this tectonic activity was taking place still, I believe, when the when the water was receding at that point. But uh, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. But it's, you know, that's John Barngarder's argument all along has been, you know, even though he's a co-author of the Catastrophic Opaque Tectonics paper where they kind of established the KPG as the, maybe the end, you know, the end of the flood, he disagreed with them. He said because of this too much seafloor that was still created. I mean, you're talking a third of the ocean crust, if not more. Uh, so that's that's the first argument that I would like to present. That you know, the flood. I don't believe the flood was over, and there's really no indication it was slowing down until maybe the Plum wow. Island. So you start to see the Hawaiian Islands start showing up above the surface because whatever whatever caused that chain of islands, a hot spot, whatever you want to call it. You know, you don't see them above the surface until late about the Pliocene time. Yeah, and so that's just. When you once you've used up all the original ocean crust and consumed it all, then everything kind of stopped, and that's why we're still moving this much per day, you know, today. But in the during the runaway subduction process, you're looking at you know meters per second type of thing. But you know the argument against that is, is what was slowing down, but there's no real indication it was. So that's my, that's the first point. Too much ocean crust forming still through the most of the Cenozoic. And the Todd, second, you you you're you're looking puzzled. I'm just wondering whether. Todd, Todd's wanting some clarification. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It's just too, my face. Too much um, geophysics. <laughs> I can send you a picture of the yeah. ocean. If you look at the ocean so, crust, you know, look. Right. Google ocean crust. It's the age of the ocean crust seafloor. You can look it up. Yeah. And, so how how old? Let's 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 put some numbers on this. How? Let's take the Atlantic Ocean. How old is the oldest part of the Atlantic? Just in radiometric millions of years dating. Uh, how old are we talking? Well, you're looking at. It goes back to the Serica or Absaroka mega sequence, so like late, you know, Jurassic. You could even argue maybe they're okay. Triassic at the oldest. Okay. That's the oldest ocean crust in, the, in like the Mediterranean and places on the edges of North America and Africa, West Africa and okay. Eastern North America. You're looking at stuff that's like Jurassic and possibly, you know, if you want okay. to include some of the intrusions, maybe Triassic where you're breaking up Pangaea, so to speak. And that's the right. oldest so, ocean crust in the world, really. That's that's, that's out. Oh wow. So it's all you know, it's all pretty new, it's all pretty young. Yeah, that is new. Yeah, so for 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 all of our audience there, you you think about here's your here's your di- here's your Cenozoic where all the mammals are. Here's the dinosaurs in the middle, and here's all this stuff down here that's the Paleozoic. Uh, if you think that this is all flood, then your oceans are all the ocean basins are at the oldest right here in the middle of the dinosaurs. So you've got this huge section of flood deposited rock. Where there's no ocean basin, which I don't know, that maybe be weird. I don't know. Well, that's why you, <laughs> you only find the sediments preserved on the continents that were washed out of the continents today. So all that mm-hmm. oh, the earliest, we believe, the earliest part of the flood, uh, that ocean crust, wherever those sediments were, they were consumed by the yeah. production process or, or smeared yeah. on and accreted on to make California and you know, different parts of right. the West Coast. Right. Right. It is. Okay. Odd. It is odd that there, you know. I mean, that should be a flag to the. Conventional geology community, like how come the continents are old, and yet the ocean crust is so young? You know, it's, it fits the whole flood model, I believe, better than than the conventional geology. So, but if you look sure. at, you know, if you Google that, you'll see a map, and you can see how much is Cenozoic, and you know, the, it kind of makes the crust equally. You can go to look down the Atlantic, you can look in the Pacific, you see a tremendous amount of ocean crust was still forming during the, you know, Tejas or the Tertiary, whatever you want to call it. But okay. so that's that's one argument. Which I agree yeah. with. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I'm really struck by that figure that you gave of a third to a half of all the modern ocean floor is Cenozoic in age. So, you know, that seems significant. You know, whatever that means, that 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 seems significant. So, yeah. So anyway, c- c- come on and tell us about the the, the okay. next piece of evidence. Okay. As well, well the too. sediments. If you, if you look at the sediments, and I've just finished the fifth continent. You know, finished up Asia, and so I'm still working on Australia, which is very small by comparison. But Australia is a little weird because there's a lot more Precambrian sediments there, which compared to most continents. But there, there's Precambrian sediments everywhere. I keep track of those as well. Which, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure how much of that's from the flood, how much is you know earliest flood or not. But nonetheless, if you ignore that and just start with the Cambrian, for example, the Sauk mega sequence, where everybody agrees these are flood sediments. In the Cambrian explosion, you know, the first all the major animal phyla show up all at once all over the world. You look at just that, all the way up through the what we call the Phanerozoic, which is the Cambrian through you know, basically the Ice Age, almost just before the Ice Age. Uh, you could even include that. But if you just look at those, those six mega sequences, 
you add them all up, you find out the, the Tejas, the uppermost te tertiary sequence, compiles 36% of the total sedimentary rock deposits in the world. So you've got over a third of the rocks in that Cenozoic or that Tejas mega sequence. To me, again, that's as compelling as making a third of the ocean crust. You've got over a third of the sediments all in that last mega sequence, which to me argues against, you know, these are from local catastrophes because uh, there's just so much sediment and there's just so much. And this includes the offshore areas up through about the shelf. So I kept track of that as well in my in my studies, but it's just a tremendous amount. And a lot of it is offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, in different places. But 36% of the total Phanerozoic rock record is tertiary, which is above the KPG boundary. To me, that's 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 pretty compelling that, that you know there's something still globally affecting and depositing these sediments. I, I just I, I don't see any, any better explanation for that. Because I didn't it wasn't yeah. even much till I did in Asia. And it's like, wow, there's just so much there. Uh before it was maybe a third, you know, or thirty percent, but Asia pushed it up uh to even more. So there's there's a lot of it is offshore, as I mentioned. You can go to the Gulf of Mexico, for example. There's a huge deposit out there discovered about 20 years ago called the Whopper Sand. And that's at the bottom of this Tejas mega sequence. I believe it's from sheet wash as the ocean was reaching its peak, which I believe was about the KPG. I think that was the, the maximum coverage we see globally when I push the button on my computer. The maximum surface area ends up being at the KPG boundary, but the maximum amount of volume is in the sequence above, which washed offshore a lot of it. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic there. You, you know, the maximum coverage, which I believe represents the high point of the flood, uh, probably day 150 of the flood, according to the Bible, uh, seems to be around the end of the Zuni, end of the Cretaceous, you know, right about the beginning of the tertiary. The boundary is a little bit off from, if you look at the, the mega sequences, they're not exactly the same as the KPG, it's a little bit above it, but, but nonetheless, that shows the maximum surface coverage that I'm seeing, and the maximum volume is this is the sequence above, which is again shifts offshore. And I was making, you know, talking about that whopper sand. That whopper sand is is a big mystery to the conventional geologist because it's a flat bottom and a flat top, and it's this big, huge sand that's 200 miles offshore, uh, in covering much of the deep Gulf of Mexico, and they drilled into it in seven and ten thousand feet of water, uh, and just tapped into it and like, wow. You know, this is a whopper sand, and, and it shouldn't be there. It, you know, it's it's too thick. It should be no sand that far offshore that thick. It's it's over a thousand foot thick. And some and you're, it's almost two thousand foot thick. It's pure. You're so you're you're calling that uh, just just to make sure that I'm hearing you right. The whopper sand. I didn't name like, it that. The oil company like the burger, it. the whopper. Yes, the oil company named <laughs> okay. it that it's so big. It shouldn't be there. Because it's just a whopper. Yeah. It, it, okay. It, it, Other whopper. burgers are available. But <laughs> have the big back sand somewhere else. <laughs> exactly. it, it's like the whopper. It's not the junior whopper. It's it's the whopper. No, no, this is the real whopper. Is, yeah. Okay. You know, you're looking at stuff that's 200 miles offshore, and there's no models in the conventional geology to get sand that far that out there that far. And it's and again, it's the key if you're a geologist, it's a flat bottom and a flat top. There's no transition. You know, it's not like finding upward or coursing upward or any of that. It's just like you dumped. A huge load of sand up there, which I believe is the beginning of the receding phase, which is the very bottommost layer of that Tejas mega sequence. Which a lot of the mega sequences start out with the sand, just like the Tabit sandstone starts the sock one. Uh, we see the same thing, and and most of this is offshore. So I believe there's a, a rapid shift in water direction, bringing a lot of sediment, high energy sediment offshore into the Gulf, and then after that, way up, it became mostly clay as the water slowed down as it drained off, and so the when my the chief geologist at Chevron uh, came to see me when I was doing a poster session at a oil and gas conference about the whopper sand was was part of it when I first kind of put that into my North American model. I couldn't mention the flood, you know, because it was a conventional geology thing. But I talked about the shift in, you know, they believe in a flooding of the you know the high seas in the Cretaceous. You know, there was the Cretaceous Interior Seaway and all that as well. Uh, this conventional geologists see that, but then there was. They've also discovered there seems to be a shift in water direction offshore. And I think that's what explains the whopper sand. It wasn't just a river channel. It was the whole huge sheet wash coming off that put it out there. And he, he even said, when you know, we wouldn't let you guys look out there because we didn't believe there's any sand. There's no real model to get you out there. And I, he goes, we were wrong, weren't we? I said, yeah. And I said, I think there's other whopper sands out, out there as well. Like off Nigeria, if you keep going off there, they just haven't drilled deep enough yet. But I think a lot of that represents 
you know, sand that had to have been moved out there, a major drainage of North America, uh, which fits the perfect timing of, you know, once the reach the high point at the KPG, and then the water shifts directions, comes off, and you get this huge whopper sand, they call it, in the Gulf of Mexico that covers almost the whole deep water Gulf of Mexico area. And in some places, it's almost 2,000 foot deep or thick. So <laughs> it's to me, it's, it's you know, it's, it's evidence of a flood. It's evidence of, of a massive deposit that conventional geologists can't explain, but I think it's the shift in, in water direction. So you've got the geophysical so, evidence so far of making all that ocean crust, you know, a third or more ocean crust. You've got the 36% of the sediments globally in the Tejas tertiary, and you've got, you know, individual features like the Whopper sand that really support that idea. Mm. Tim, ju- just a point of clarification. So did I hear you right that you're saying um, the aerial coverage of sediments is greatest in the KPG? Uh, around the KPG or in the Cretaceous, yeah, the, the aerial coverage still when you when a, when a, you know we kind of map it all out where the extents are and I use surface maps to help with those extents of every country every kind of we look at in addition to the oil well data uh, yeah. the mapping surface area coverage still is the zuni or the you know ends at the KPG boundary essentially. So yeah. to me, I, but the, I use but, the bi- but the biggest the biggest volume is in is in the Cenozoic. So so what's the aerial distribution of those Cenozoic sediments? The, the biggest volume, but how how are they distributed? I mean, you said a lot are offshore. Well, right, there was a lot of onshore too. It, it depends on the country yeah. where you are. Again, North right. America is not as much. It's mostly up against the mountains, and then a lot of it's offshore. But in other countries, like in Europe, you see a lot more Cenozoic onshore. Uh, but there is a shift. You can see a definite shift to some of the offshore shelf areas right. as, as you go along. But there's a lot of sediments onshore as well, uh, and mm-hmm. particularly North Africa. And that whole area was still – that's one of my next points I want to talk about is is the yeah. you know, continuous deposition of limestone from the yeah. cave. Oh, well, come, on, come on to that. Yeah. And so yeah. That, that, but that, to me, it's there's a lot of big things, you know, the global things. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting, and that's why I do pick the flood – high point, just like the global sea level curve that the conventional geologists have, I don't agree with the lower one. I don't think there's a, mm-hmm. a peak in the Ordovician Cambrian because I don't see that on most continents. There's not a big flooding event. Uh, and you right. see consistency, like in North Africa, the first three sequences, just North Africa, North Africa, North Africa. So there, you know, I think that was, even though there's some erosion between events, I don't think there's, I still think you're getting kind of a pretty good picture of where these deposits are or were originally. Uh, but uh, it's 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 pretty pretty amazing. But I want to mention one other thing before I the Whopper mm-hmm. Sand. There's another large thick deposit I came across in my studies. It was about 17 kilometers, which is about 10 miles, I think, to Todd and the rest of us in the United States. 10, 11 miles. <laughs> Thank you. 17 kilometers of Tejas sediment in the South Caspian Basin alone. So you go to the South Caspian Sea, and there's this huge, the southern half of it's this big, huge hole. Where it's almost like God pushed his thumb into it, and all these sediments just piled in during the you know, the Tejas during that tertiary system. So, and they find oil in there, you know, which implies that there was deposits from the marine realm, giving us the source racks for the oil, that sort of thing as well. So there's, there's some really, really thick deposits. And mm-hmm. the South China Sea is the same way. And the, the one thing I didn't put in my notes here is that we also see tremendous amounts of coal offshore, huge coal deposits in the South China Sea and off Borneo and places like that, as I studied the South, off Vietnam, offshore in the the Oligocene, it's called, which is kind of the middle of a tertiary. And then you go to Siberia, they drill wells off Siberia into the, into the ocean, into the northern, uh, into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, there's a bunch of wells out there that tag in tertiary coals as well, you know, miles offshore. Some of these are 100 miles, 200 miles offshore in places. A tremendous amount of coal that, you know, I think also is, is vegetation material that was washed off once the water reaches high point and also was pushed off these shore areas as well. And that, to me, that's Difficult to explain with, you know, local catastrophes to get coal, you know, many many miles offshore, off the. And I'm seeing this off Australia too. There's some places where you see the Cenozoic coals offshore, uh, extensive deposits, but never be mined. But they're drilling through them and they hit the oil wells. And so this is things that, you know, most people didn't really realize. Oil companies just they log it and tell you what it is, but they don't seem to care either. Uh, so it's some interesting geology that really supports that this Cenozoic is. Something different was happening where you're shifting this, you know, the, the direction of flow was offshore, bringing those coals up. And uh, that kind of gets to the, I guess, while I'm on the subject of coal, onshore yeah. coals, the onshore coals like in Wyoming and 
in places, and even in Europe, Germany, in places, you get massive lignite deposits, which is the really immature type of coal. Uh, you get so much coal above the KPG in these massive coals in Wyoming that are 200 foot thick, 60 meters thick, and they're about 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers in area. And there's, you know, there's just like they got pushed up against the Bighorn Mountains that were rising as the water was draining up North America. So these are the power, these are that, the Powder River Basin coals. Powder River Basin, right? correct. But we see coals like that in South America. We see massive amounts of coal in South America in the Cenozoic and, and across Europe, you know, particularly Germany and places, you see massive amounts of coal in the Cenozoic as well, uh, or at least lignite, which is, you know, just didn't get very deep enough to get higher grade coal. But there's massive amounts of vegetation across the world above the KPG, including offshore, as I mentioned earlier, that got pushed way offshore. So to me, that, again, argues for a higher flood boundary, that these are still part of the receding phase of the flood. But let me get back to one of the other major points that I think is, is really compelling, is the sediments around the Middle East, that I studied around Turkey, where the ark was supposed to land, you know, people argue about where it exactly landed. The Bible tells us the mountains of Ararat. I don't, not, you know, Dr. Stelling, uh, neither one of us are big fans of Mount Ararat, even though Henry Morris was and other people, uh, because that's more of an ice age volcano, which we all kind of agree was post flood. And so if it was there, it probably would have been buried by lavas and flows and everything else. I think it might have been a little bit west of there. There's a, a ridge that came up right about the time of the KPG, which would have lined up with my day 150 interpretation for the KPG is the maximum point of the flood. Uh, and so there's a possibility I landed on this ridge. But uh, it's, uh, you can read about it on our website, if I see our website if you want to look that up. But uh, if you think the Ark lands somewhere in Turkey, somewhere in that range, southeast Turkey area, and you look at the geology across Africa, North Africa, look at the geology in the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, you know, places where the Tower of Babel is supposed to be built at some point, exactly where. And you cross Europe. You can go across the main, you know, not, not England per se, but across the, much of the, what do you guys call that, Paul? The, the continent. The continent, yeah, of, yeah, the continent. continental Europe, you still see marine sediments, marine rocks, and, and particularly across Syria and Iraq and North Africa and even parts of Turkey, you see limestone, which is a marine rock, and salt, which are marine rocks, uh, deposited continually from below the KPG in the Cretaceous all the way up to in places of the Miocene, which is at the surface in Syria and Iraq and places, and even the Pliocene in places in Europe. So you do see massive amounts of marine sediments, and that's one of the arguments that the flood is over at the KPG. Is everything supposed to go continental? Well, I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of marine rocks globally. Now, if you go to North America, you know most of the Cenozoic deposits are near the Rocky Mountains in that region. That's all that's preserved. You do see a lot of what could be interpreted as continental. But if you go to Europe and you know Middle East and areas where the Tower of Babel is supposed to be built, you know, you've got continuous limestone marine deposits all the way up to the top of the tertiary. And so to me, it's hard to say the flood ended when you've got that area still flooded because uh, you're still depositing marine sediments all the way up. And I know Andrew Snelling made that argument in Israel. He saw those marine deposition all the way up to the Eocene, from Cretaceous to the Eocene. So he said the flood boundary must be about there in Israel, you know, and maybe a little bit higher than what I think he's more of a KPG fan, like I used to be, until I started looking at all this geology. And, the, you know, the global geology to me is, is is fascinating and it, I just feel fortunate that God's allowed me to do this to look at this stuff and you know I'm just trying to pick okay I think this is you know it, it's the maximum surface coverage and I see the maximum flooding you know that's the KPG seems to be about the high point and then after that I see it, everything else above that you know with all these other arguments the geophysics or the seafloor the the you know 36 percent of the sediments in the in the Tejas. Rock, rock like the Whopper sand, I think only could be deposited by a huge massive runoff of, of the North American continent. And the coal seams that we see deposited, particularly in the lower part of the, the tertiary, uh, many of those like in Wyoming are the very bottom part, but still above the KPG. And then there's even a couple of little things I want to mention. There's, there's the lack of erosion at the KPG. You know, where are the canyons? Where's the erosional remnants that can we see around the world today? We see areas, huge areas that were scoured as the floodwaters ran off. You just see these little remnants like in Monument Valley and places like that. You see all these plantation surfaces that 
people like Mike Gordon, I was pointing out, uh, you see massive amounts of erosion that took place uh, at the end of the flood, but you don't really see canyons forming until recently, you know, a Grand Canyon, uh, you know, however you think that formed, uh, you don't really see that. You don't see canyons at the Cretaceous. So if it was the end of the flood, you'd expect to see lots of canyons that were maybe filled in by later sediments, but there's really, it's just flat. If you go to the KPG where you see it, you go to the next, the tertiary above it, it's pretty much flat, just like the rocks we see in Grand Canyon. There's no evidence of a shift in, uh, I guess, a long amount of time. Uh, but the flood was over, you'd expect to see a lot of erosion. And so that's one of the things I pointed out. There's, to me, it's, it's, and, and if you're a conventional geologist, you should see that at every level, you know, because you're talking about millions of years between all these rock, you don't see canyons at every level. You know, once in a while you see erosion or tilting and playing off like a sick car point or something like that, but that's can easily be explained very quickly during the flood year with some tectonics and, you know, rapid erosion. Uh, but uh, I think there should be more evidence, erosional evidence at the KPG. And even, I guess the last thing I really want to bring up, and then we can discuss some of these things, and I kind of call it the elephant in the room, and that's the, you know, a lot of the Field intelligence out there, and I love them to death. You know, Marcus Ross, and you know, we disagree in our kids, but at the end of the day, we still go out to dinner, and we still, uh, hopefully, we still love each other. It's, it, I try not to make it all personal, but sometimes it seems like we still get that way. We're humans, and we we need to forgive and forget. But even though we can disagree, uh, that's there's, that's I think we're always getting stirred up by by Satan to fight against each other too much and hold grudges. But we need to. Move on, I think, and you know I'm as guilty as anybody else for some of that. But so I want to apologize to the viewing audience now, and you know, I, I try to be better about that now. But, but we can disagree and still get along. You know, we should all be one yeah. in Christ is the key. But I think a lot of that, you know, they argue at the end of the flood. Marcus Ross has done a lot of statistics and showing, okay, these certain animals cross the KPG, and these animals or they talk or the KPG, the the, the Paleocene Pleistocene boundary, and Chad Arnold's done the same sort of thing with some marsupials and things like that. Uh, but the, you know, it, to me, the elephant in the room is, well, where did these animals come from? Where did they first show up in the fossil record? And so many of the large mammals show up, and the whales included, in the lower part of the tertiary, you know, or the Tejas mega sequence. That's their first appearance. And just like we see dinosaurs' first appearance and all these other animals' first appearance, we see first appearances, sudden first appearances, then we see stasis, and then we see them, you know, disappear in the rock record. To me, the pattern is the same across the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. But, you know, you have to explain where these things came from. And I asked Mark Cassetti, he goes, yeah, that's, that's a problem. But to me, that's the, that's the big problem. You've got all these angiosperms that show up for the first time in the Cenozoic. And you've got all these large mammal groups, horses. You know, you can argue about the evolution of horses all you want. Where did those horses come from in the first place? You know, where did the mammoths come from? How do you get these mammoths back across these continents when the water at the end of the flood would have been about 190 meters higher than, you know, than it, than it, than it was. Uh, and even today with the ice still in Greenland and Iceland, you still would, you melt that, you still raise water level 70 meters higher than today. And so you're looking at, you know, there was no land bridges to get from Turkey where the Ark landed somewhere in that area to cross to North America and the Bering Sea, you know, it would have been still water. And so you have to argue that massively large animals like mammoths floated on floating vegetation mats or some other type of, you know, camels that we see in the, the Badlands in, in South Dakota. Hoofed animals and horses, how do you, how would they float on logs for possibly months at a time across the oceans? I, I don't know if we've got a viable mechanism to move large mammals. Like, you know, small ones, yes. Big ones, a little more of a problem. But uh, to me, the, the first appearances of all these things, again, argues that this is still part of the flood. I think that's what Henry Morris's argument was. We still saw all these mammals and, and flowering plants showing up for the first time. And even, and even the coal seams that we see, you know, those massive ones in Wyoming, those are different plants than what we see earlier. You know, most of England uh, is mostly the lycopod coals. And in eastern North America, is lycopod coals, different plants. Uh, but as you go higher, you, I think you've got a different ecological zones that were buried. And uh, I know some people hate that idea, but it seems to, to me that seems to support the better fossil record, why things change as you go up the rock record. But you see different plants even at the end. So the coal seams even, those ones offshore I talked about in the Cenozoic and the ones in Wyoming and across Germany and South America, those are all different plants than we saw earlier. So 
it's 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 some interesting things, but in the global perspective of things, you know, it's it's just difficult to move these animals back. I think without land bridges, which is what the ice age provided. So the the beauty of the plate tectonics, catastrophic plate tectonics, is it provides a mechanism for the flood to push the water higher and higher and higher. So I see a progressive flood, different environments as you go up globally. But it also explains the ice age. You know, God had a plan to repopulate the earth by lowering sea level, by, you know, like a sponge sucking up water into the ice and drop sea level temporarily for maybe a few hundred years to allow animals, big animals and humans to migrate around from continent to continent to continent. And, and it's all because of the subduction zone volcanoes that produce those aerosols. They're up in all over the world, you know, in we see that in the rock record. I'm recording volcanics as well in my studies, and we see an increase in volcanic activity in the late Zuni into the tertiary. And of course, that continued in the Ice Age. Uh, and that helped cool the earth enough that all the hot water produced by the new seafloor, high evaporation, came down as snow in the north. And you know, there's not a lot of land in the deep south except Antarctica, but so you mostly have your ice age affecting the northern hemisphere. But that was temporary. You know, it came and went to allow land bridges. I feel that was God's, you know, he had like a plan all along. It's amazing how God had these plans. And you know, these plans for me, his plans for you and everybody listening out there. But, you know, he had a plan to repopulate the earth. I think that was it. And so that fits in with my interpretation of the flood boundary being higher as well. That, you know, the flood finally ended, drained off, and then they, they got off. And then within a few hundred years, you had the ice building, building, and building, and you've got these land bridges that opened up temporarily and and you know what were the humans doing they were disobeying right away saying we're going to stay here tower of babel they were going to miss that you know limited window of opportunity to follow the herds of animals across it you know so if, I, I think it wasn't for the ice age which was an essential ending to the flood and kind of a consequence of the flood you wouldn't have had animals in north america columbus would have came across and there'd be like no deer there'd be you know maybe people would have came across in boats eventually but it's hard to bring a lot of animals across. And so even, you know, you could have walked from France to England, which I know scares Paul, because <laughs> you want to keep the continental people away. Uh, and you could have walked to Ireland, you know, during the Ice Age. It was, a, you know, that, they call it Doggerland, I believe it is, that you know, the whole area dropped. And so there's, you know, the timing of everything, you know, guys, timing was perfect on that, I believe. But to me, all this, you know, these evidence, these eight or nine points that I've talked about uh, in kind of, really shows that there's a lot of geology and paleontology because you've got to wonder, okay, how do these things show up? You know, where they disappeared exactly at the end, maybe I'm off a little bit, maybe it should be maybe the Miocene. I think John Baumgartner picks the bottom of the Pliocene, uh, but there's there's compelling geophysical and I think global geologic evidence that the flood was still going on and up through the, you know, the high point was the KPG boat and then I think it was the receding phase for the most of the tertiary. And that's that's what I publish. That's what I try to show the evidence for. And that's why I really appreciate you guys giving me the chance to to ramble on and on and on about this with my Michigan accent. Uh, but it's well that's Tim, that's been that's been very helpful. And thank you again so much for for, for being here and doing that. And we will definitely um put links in our show notes to uh, your book, um Carved in Stone. And also some of your published papers. I know you've published a number of papers in CRSQ and Journal of Creation about some of the topics that you've talked about. And we'll we'll put links in the show notes for all of our listeners. I, I wonder if we could just kind of begin to wind up in the in the last few minutes. And unless Todd's got any points that he particularly wants to raise here, Todd, before I kind of move on. You know You're just absorbing no, this like gonna, a sponge, I can I'm see. Gonna, I got a I got a <laughs> long I got a long <laughs> rambly <laughs> I got a long rambling story that I could tell, and uh, let's save that for another episode. How about that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, as we as we begin to sort of wind up this episode, then um, we've already touched on this a little bit about implications for for a broader model. Um, the position that you've kind of set out here, Tim. Um, what does it tell us about the flood, uh, the recolonization of the world after the flood? Um, and, uh, you know, are there any challenges that you think remain? What, what are the, what are the unresolved questions as well that all of this raises? Well, there, there are unresolved questions that, you know, there's a lot of details that, you know, I'm kind of, what I'm able to do through my studies is kind of give the big picture of things. 
And I think I think I'm getting closer to what actually might have actually happened. But there are details. Of course, we need to work out some of the arguments that the paleontologists make for the KEPG boundary, because there's some strange statistical things going on where certain animals seem to come back to Australia and that sort of thing. And why do they come back to Australia? Why there's some footprints above the KEPG boundary? There's a few issues like that. Uh, you know, and one guy argued, well, maybe it's like the crocodiles and the otters and things like that. Maybe they didn't all die. Maybe they weren't officially, you know, what God would consider air breathing, land breathing. Because, you know, fish, many fish survived the flood. They were probably in the deep water. Uh, so there's, you know, in, the, in whales and things that we see in the oceans today, they some of them got caught in the waves and got trapped and, and buried in fossils on the land as they were waves are going in. But most of the marine life seems to have survived. Other than I think complete environments were changed and altered, like the trilobites and many of the Paleozoic coals. I think those particular pre-flood environments were totally destroyed uh, in the flood and were able, not able to repopulate. So we don't see a lot of those earlier deposits of fossils that we see. We see mostly the later fossils. And exactly why that is and the stratification of the, of the of the fossils. Why do we see different fossils in the Cambrian versus the Ordovician versus the Silurian? You know, why do we see consistencies even even if they're all mostly marine up through the lower Carboniferous or the Mississippian? Uh, why is that? Why is there still a stratification? So there's a lot of uh, areas of study. And, and exactly, did the flood end where it, it did? You know, did it end at the Pliocene or or the, below the Pliocene? And we need. I think we. You know, some people have questioned the dating of the fossils and. In uh, Australia, are they really Miocene? But should should they be Ice Age fossils and that sort of thing? You know, someone needs to go down there and do a couple of PhDs on that to sort that out. That's, that's not an easy thing to do. And so, some of these things, you know, I'm providing kind of a big picture with some specific, you know, things like the Whopper Sand and the coals here and there. But there's a lot of questions. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the program, I still am not sure where the flood begins everywhere. That's another question we need to look at. Uh, in most places, it's obvious you got Cambrian sands right on top of crystal and rock. It's like, ooh, there you go. You know, it's it's obvious, great unconformity. But where you have all these sediments like in Grand Canyon, how many of those, even though they're tilted and eroded off by the Tapete sandstone that came in as part of that shock sequence, are some of those part of the flood? You know, the lavas maybe are those part of the flood, the Cardenas basalt, that sort of thing. And so those need to be looked at almost case by case. And I may get a chance to do that when I get done. I may go back and start trying to say, okay, let's assume this. And I've been keeping track of a lot of these sediments around the world on every continent, the Precambrian. Uh, maybe we can sort some of that or at least give us some ideas. But there's a lot of debate. Again, the biggest problem I need to address is maybe the statistical evidence that the paleontologists have argued for the KPG. But uh, to me, the it's the it's the weight of the data. It's the and grab it. I guess you know you can. To me, that it's compelling. The global geology, to me, is showing that the flood boundary's got to be higher, and the fossils are in those rocks. But you know the rocks are much more voluminous than you know fossils are a little bit dependent on what you've discovered and what's been eroded and, and you know away and what's what's not been found uh, still in the future. So to get kangaroos in Australia, for example, you had to, they had to come off the Arctic. They had to go across Asia. So we know they had to exist in Asia for a while, but they have gone extinct and left no fossil trail. And so a lot of these animals, they had to go across these continents to get to South America. And to get there, you know, the question is, without sea level dropping from an ice age, how do you get them those distant continents to begin with? But also, even in Australia, how did you know you had to have kangaroos in Asia? So why did they only survive after the flood in Australia? And it's, it's possibly because there there was still a little bit of water. You never, even if you drop the sea level, there's still a little bit of water between some of the islands. And you, so a lot of the predators, like lions and tigers and bears, never got to Australia. And so maybe that's why kangaroos went extinct in Asia after the flood, but not in Australia. And some of the marsupials as well. I don't know. There's a, it's a, there's a lot of details that only people like Todd can figure out for us to do. <laughs> and we like, I know what I'm doing. I don't we know what I'm doing. We need biologists <laughs> to work on it too. We do. We do. I mean, yeah. it's it's like it's a, it's amazing to me to see you know God's timing and His hand in this flood event. That there's all this judgment for wickedness of of mankind, and you know we're still sinners. You know, it's that's all we are as sinners. We just believe in Jesus as our Savior to forgive us our sins. But it's 
there's all this evidence of the flood, and yet there's still the secular community still sits there and says, where's the evidence for the flood? I'm like, look down. You know, below your feet, there's thousands of feet of fossils. And, and it's like, it amazes me that nobody believed in the flood except for eight people get on the ark. Nobody believed the flood was coming. But here we have all this evidence globally of a flood, whether you pick the boundary high or low. Everybody, you know, in creation agrees it was this massive flood. And yet they still, it's they don't see it. You look at Grand King and, you know, God split that open and he wrote it down through it to show you, look at all these layers. And you can follow those same layers, you know, flat like that all the way across North America. And you find the same layers in Europe and, and Africa. It's amazing that everything is global. It's a global geologic column because it was a global flood. And there's even people that disagree with that. I mean, just, you know, but if we disagree on stuff, as scientists do, we still need to get along. You know, I think yeah. we've all been a little bit guilty of that. You know, we, we get arrogant, you know, we get pride and that's, that's, that's not good. That's not the right attitude to have. And we, but, so I really appreciate you guys giving me a chance to. Well, we've, air, we air really appreciate my data. So, you know, yeah, we really data. appreciate you coming, coming along and doing this, Tim. And, <laughs> um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there are so many unanswered questions. We have to have some humility uh, about the things that we know and the things that we don't know. And, uh, you've done a great job of of setting out the case for a high f- a flood boundary, and we really appreciate you doing that. And as I said earlier, we'll we'll definitely um, link to ICR and to your book and okay. to some of your other publications, so that people can follow that up. Todd, um, next time uh, we have another episode, a bit like this one, uh, but with another guest, and mm-hmm. that guest will be presenting a different perspective on the flood post flood boundary, and I'm sure that's going to be just as uh, fascinating and enlightening. And I hope our viewers are enjoying this as as much as as we are. Uh, thanks yeah. again, ever so much, Tim, and everybody. We will see you next time. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. See right, you thank next you time. Very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes and all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.